I want to talk a little bit more about the stillness on film. And the stillness, as you say, the film stillness on film and television has gone into the theater, as it were, and good for that. But what you're describing in, in the mimicry that you're using and how Russell Crowe is a kind of uh, acting that is disappearing. Uh, and I would maybe call it bravura acting. Uh, if you look at Laurence Olivier bringing, you know, endless uh, false teeth here, wig <laughs> here, funny glasses yeah. here, but in impersonation, the impersonation of the acting tradition is lessening. The being still and being just very close to who you actually are is on the rise, so to speak. Yeah. Which in a way <coughs> is, uh, I mourn losing the bravura element to it because there is an element to performance that takes storytelling above a certain level. Yes, yes, and I think the, the roles the, the written in the big classic vein demand bravura acting. I think they should, they should get it. But you should be able to also switch in midstream and suddenly become so modern and so real and so still and so unbravura that the audience is shocked. They're, they're, they're transported. They're in some way, you, you have to hold them in the palm of your hand at one point. And you can only do that if you stop throwing yourself about for a minute and just control them. Larry was, Larry Olivier was able to do that too. But the, f the strange thing about Olivier, because I knew him and worked with him, and, but on the stage, particularly in his Othello, for example, he was a, he, he, I say to myself, was it a great performance? He, yes, it was. It, it, it was a great performance because he overwhelmed his audience. And I think that is the duty of, a, of an actor who aspires to greatness. They must be able to overwhelm the audience. He overwhelmed it not by pathos, which he does not have. He's one of the few great actors in the world that does not have pathos. Ralph Richardson has pathos. Marlon Brando has pathos. Um, I'm sure I saw a, a performance of Othello by Frederick Volk up in Stratford here, the Czechoslovakian actor, who came on and he, he was the op opposite of bravura, but he was huge in size and vocal power, but he had pathos. He just had to stand there and you, you died for him. Larry acts pathos marvelously. So he knows how to, or he knew how to, put all, pull all the stops out. He had such an extraordinary amount of technique, Larry, that he could, he, he could reach into his, his pathos ba box and, and um, sprinkle a little pathos on this part. So he knew how to act it even though he didn't have the gift. Because that you're born with. That right. you are born with. You can't act, cannot act pathos, except Larry was able to. So it was a great performance apart from the fact that it, he had no pathos. Because you were staggered by his technique. That was what the performance was. You just were dazzled by Othello was all over the place. Being in, at one moment a Jamaican step and fetch it, and the next moment La Puta from John Buchan's, whatever that book was, that wonderful book, Prester John. Um, that sort of, that, but, but, but that has to go on. There have to be, and you, you're right, you don't see it. I think, I think Al, I keep mentioning Al all the time, Pacino, but because he's an example of a modern American actor who is able to do that. He's very bra bravura on the screen. He sometimes is over the top. But he dares. I love him because he dares to be over the top. And then on the stage, uh, he can do it too. His Herod was outrageously over the top. Wonderful stuff. Needed to be. Called for it. And he's able to fill it. Yeah. So it does still exist, but not to the extent. Donald Wolfert, which I, was the first Lear I ever saw. Talk about bravura. I mean, my God. There were some wonderful moments in that, though, that I'll never forget. Bravura vocally, physically, emotionally? Uh, both. 
but mostly vocally. What, wild moving up and down the scale, or how do you mean? Well, he didn't have um, perhaps Larry's tenor notes, but uh, he had the, uh, all the cello and the viola and the violin section were going like mad. He didn't have the trumpet, but he, did, but he had most of the other instruments. And it was a very sort of gruff voice, and it's like that, you know. It was, real, it was like if you'd given Robert Newton another bottle of scotch to consume. <laughs> You had ten Ro Robert Newtons. That was Wolfert, <laughs> as as Valponi or Lear. But Lear was he was wonderful. He had to, he because he came on like that, and that's how you've got to come on as Lear. You've got, either got to be deranged from the beginning, or slightly suggest a deranged. Where did you see the? Where did you see this Lear? In Montreal when I was a kid. But I was about fifteen. He brought his company to Montreal with him, and I remember he said in some radio interview afterwards. That he was, yes, I always like coming to Montreal. I always have such a good time here. Um, and next year I will come again in the works of the Bard. But with this time, I hope a better company. My God. Outrageous man. Oh, my God. So, he was a real terrible old Dickensian actor manager. He stepped right out of that period. Did you ever meet him? Yeah, he presented me with my prize in England when I won the when I won the uh, award for best actor for Beckett. It was and Donald Wolfert who presented me with the Figured Prize. Sort of vicious circle. And he said something stupid. He said, "I am, an, I haven't seen Beckett." He said, "As he's present, but re but report speaks goldenly of young Plummer's prophet." What a what a bullshit artist is. I have a very difficult time getting tickets. <laughs> I said, what a, that's a bullshit artist. He could have come on a matinee. The same eight old ladies were there. Why didn't he join them? <laughs> so I got up to thank him. And I was so drunk by that time because it was the end of the evening. I made the mistake. I didn't learn you don't drink until your speech is over. And I was consuming. <laughs> and I got up and I said, I don't understand why Sir Donald has had such trouble coming to see Beckett, because I've seen Sir Donald so many times without any trouble at all. Oh! What a Very good. I, I, I know. I felt awful after. Did you? And he came to see it, actually. He came three or four weeks later and came back. And he'd forgiven me, obviously. He said, oh, he said something like, something totally out of left field like I was wearing no shirt because Henry's the last scene he's been flogged you know and I just come off stage and Donald was in the, the door open and Wolford came in and said ah at least your hair your hairy chest keeps you warm doesn't it in the winter and I said I'm so, I'm so outrageous man this man is a horrible slug that's why he was so great as Tamburlaine in uh, Tyrone Guthrie's production of Marlowe's play. He was like a great big slug. Again, you're talking bravura, yep. and that was necessary for those sort of outrageous over the lifetime, I mean, oversized roles, Bob Pony, mm, Tamburlaine, Lear, all the impossible parts.